Um, it's also intriguing that Debian being an association of individuals who've made common cause to create a free operating system and not a company means that there's a very inclusive set of community processes. Essentially, anybody who wants to do something interesting and is willing to subscribe to Debian's social contract and uh, participate in the collaborative and open processes of creating the distribution is welcome to apply for and become a, a Debian developer. The consequence of that is that over time, Debian has grown to support more processor architectures and to have more packages that are actually considered part of the distribution as opposed to you know, being relegated to some contributed or otherwise described secondary status than any other Linux distribution. And I would argue that as a consequence, if you care about the distribution landscape, this ecosystem that starts with Debian and percolates down through the large number of derivatives is something you have to pay attention to. And then there are the others. And the others are either others because they're a little strange as a distribution or because they have a very strongly regional focus. Asianix, for example, is this conglomerate uh, formed by companies in the Pacific Rim um, that have agreed to collaborate on a common core distribution and then deliver a specific sort of country-oriented, uh, you know, different native language-oriented distributions from that. Um, and they're particularly the red flag participant in the Asianix um, conglomerate uh, ships an awfully large number of systems. Um, it helps to be, you know, the local distribution in China, but um, you can't completely ignore that, particularly if you have regional plays in that part of the world. And there are things like Gen2 and Arch that are sort of, in some sense, do-it-yourself distributions. And um, my libertarian friends think that, you know, Arch is the greatest thing since sliced bread. <coughs> and in the same way that we used to think of Gen2, as long as you don't sp mind spending as much time uh, compiling, updating, and maintaining your operating system as you do using it. In other words, if your principal goal is to learn about the technology and to participate in uh, that creative process, they're probably great things to run. I'm fascinated at how many times you know, they're chasing down the nuances of some problem that some Debian developer has already taken care of when they package that piece of software that I just get to use. So there's lots of choices here, and as we'll talk about, um, the process of deciding what you want to do largely has to do with how you think about and how you want to acquire support. So one of the first things that you really have to think about in this distribution uh, landscape is this distinction between commercial and non-commercial distributions. I've put Ubuntu kind of with the commercial distributions because Mark and his team at Canonical would really, really like to make support revenue around Ubuntu on par with um, what the other commercial distributors get. And in fact, they've made substantial inroads in the last couple of years in terms of the share of the market that they seem to be acquiring. However, it is still very fundamentally an open source community oriented distribution that happens to have a more rigorous, more structured set of community processes than something like Debian. They have a more well-defined release schedule as a consequence of that. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's a challenge. <coughs> um, if you get down to the wire and you have to decide, you know, do we fix this or do we ship it? I don't know, I'd like to fall down on the Debian side of the equation, which is more or less, we'll ship it when it's ready. Uh, don't ask us when that will be. Um, but in the non-commercial side, there's actually sort of a huge range these days of choices. Um, and they have all sorts of different flavors. Uh, Debian, which is sort of militantly focused on preserving the freedom of the distribution, things like Fedora and OpenSUSE that are feeders to and therefore often great places to see technology previews of what might be coming in future uh, versions of their respective associated commercial distributions and things like Gen2 and Arch, as I mentioned. And really what it comes down to is it's all about choosing the support model that you want. <coughs> if you care about the chain of certification for some specific set of commercial applications, if you really need PeopleSoft's application suite, for example, then you know that you're going to want an Oracle database. And that means that there's a specific set of distributions that's been certified for. And you probably want to make sure you buy hardware from a vendor that is certifying those specific distributions. And in this case, if you are starting out as a business owner with some kind of a, a mission-critical workload that absolutely has to have traditional IT support model uh, support contracts associated with it, 
that's the way you're going to think, and that's going to lead you uh, to one or another of the commercial distributions, most likely. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that, <clears throat> as long as you understand what the costs are that are associated with it, how their licensing models work, and so forth. They are a better value than non-Linux operating systems for virtually all of the workloads you might choose to put on them. But you aren't really quite getting the full bore open source community process experience if you go down that path. That may be exactly the right choice to make, but you need to understand sort of how that's playing out. There is this continuum from sort of self-support, which I jokingly refer to as the hire three college kids, uh, a couple of six packs and a couple of pizzas and get your software installed and working, to a complete outsourcing. Companies like HP and, and some of our competitors will happily work with you to take your IT requirements and turn that into a turnkey thing that you just pay for and don't have to do yourself. And there's that whole range of stuff in between. The key to me is that by choosing to use open source operating systems and applications, you give yourself this rich set of meaningful choices about how to do things, and you break out of the cycle of being forced to accept that you know one size should fit all, and that a single company having control of um, a piece of infrastructure that's vital to your business or your university research or whatever else it is that you use computing for um, is such a good thing. And again, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that <coughs> over the years, HP has evolved to have this fairly broad ecosystem of uh, distributions that we support. In addition to providing you know, a high degree of support for uh, Red Hat and SUSE, we also provide uh, differing levels of en enablement and support for various community distributions. In this diagram, you'll notice that Debian is actually up in the box along with Red Hat and SUSE, and that's because we do actually provide uh, care packs and other official support offerings for Debian, which is sort of unique among the community distributions. That has to do with sort of the sequence of events that led us to this broad enablement of community distributions. And I think today is, is maybe perceived as a little bit of an anomaly, but it's something I'm actually fairly proud of for what are probably obvious reasons. Another thing I wanted to point to, though, if you haven't been aware of it, is that um, Back at LinuxCon in 2009, we announced the creation of this web community called communitylinux.org. Out of curiosity, how many of you have seen this before? Anybody? A couple of you? Yeah. It's not very broadly known. I, so the resource I'd like to point out, though, because this is a place with um, lots of information about how to make community distributions work on different pieces of HP hardware. And frankly, we have always invited uh, people who want to document um, recipes for making various community distributions work on non-HP hardware to also participate there, but I guess not surprisingly, given that we started it, there hasn't been a whole lot of action on that. Um, we, as a company, are starting to use this site to help request user uh, assistance in uh, working on things like pre-release install testing of new versions of Debian or um, of other community distributions. Uh, this has been a very neat thing. You know, one of the things that we as a company have the opportunity to do is to get early access to commercial distribution releases. We do a lot of stress testing of every new release of Red Hat and of SUSE and so forth that comes down the line before it ever becomes released. We would like to be able to assist community distributions in getting that same kind of pre-release breadth of attention and testing and the messaging that we're able to convey through this community Linux.org site is one of the ways that we can help to do that. Um, we are scratching our heads a little bit now after a year and a half or so of operating the site about um, you know, what the right things are to try and make that be a more compelling resource going forward. And there will be some surveys coming to people that are you know, registered with and using that site going forward. So if you haven't taken a look, spend a couple minutes, take a look. If it seems useful and interesting to you, uh, hang around a little bit. When you see the surveys go out, feel free to tell us what you think. So what is it that's changed? And what is it that makes it worth sort of thinking about this distribution thing a little bit differently in 2011? Well, it was alluded to earlier today, and if you were paying attention, you probably already know the answer to this. But the most popular Linux distribution, in fact, the most popular class of Linux distributions today aren't ones that I've talked about yet. Why is that? Well, it's because Linux is now shipping embedded in so many things that you don't know Linux is on the inside of that 
it's highly likely that even those of you who don't think you're running Linux have it somewhere in your life. For example, how many of you have a digital television? Widescreen, HD, any of that kind of stuff? Did you know it runs Linux? Pretty much every digital television sold today, almost, not entirely everyone, but the vast majority of them run Linux on the inside. Why is that? Well, it's because the silicon foundries in Asia that produce the chips that are used to do things like all of the MPEG decoding and all the frame buffering and all of that stuff that makes a digital TV work realized a few years ago, in part because of the activities of the Consumer Electronics Linux Forum that is now a working group at the Linux Foundation, which I used to be on the board of, that um, they could actually enable uh, the use of Linux without having to pay for it or charge their customers royalties for it. And in the consumer electronics market, that is a really big deal. And it's not just digital televisions. Um, even before the emergence of some of the currently hot named uh, distributions in the mobile space, um, there were more cell phones being sold in China running Linux than any other operating system. And it's just absolutely pervasive these days. It's almost interesting now to see the places where Linux isn't running. It's newsworthy if somebody actually puts a Microsoft operating system in the dashboard of a car. That car vendor will actually advertise the fact that they're doing that. <coughs> you can treat that as a warning label, okay? 